Rufus Ewing, I'm the advisor for health systems and services at the Pajo Barbados office for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean countries. Um, on behalf of the Pajo WHO representative for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean countries, Dr. Yotadis Gibray, and the director for health systems and services, Dr. James Fitzgerald, welcome you to this webinar on the clinical management of COVID-19 in the Eastern Caribbean. The countries under the representation of the PAHO office. Hello, can we, for housekeeping, can we your mic? We can minimize interruptions. Sorry, Dr. Um, Ewing, please uh, go ahead. I was just changing the, the role so you can you have the, um, access to the, the microphone. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. So on behalf of the PAHO WHO representative for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean countries, Dr. Yotadis Gabre, and the director for health systems and services, Dr. James Gerald, I welcome you to this webinar on the clinical management of COVID-19 in the Eastern Caribbean. The countries under the representation for the PAHO Barbados Office for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean countries include seven independent in English-speaking countries, uh, the three UK overseas territories, and five French territories. As of yesterday, there was 1,586,129 1, COVID-19 cases and 87,930 deaths have been reported in the region of the Americas. With 732 of these cases and 42 deaths being recorded in these 15 Eastern Caribbean countries. These countries had to increase their capacities, implement public health strategies, and reorganize their health services to mount effective responses to save lives, protect healthcare workers, and to stop the spread of COVID-19. The objective of this webinar is to facilitate the sharing of experiences in the clinical management of COVID-19 within the context of available human, material, and financial resources and applicable clinical intervention strategies. It is hoped that this sharing of experiences would enable the compilation of lessons learned based on the challenges experienced, what worked and what did not work. I now take this opportunity to introduce the moderator of this webinar, Dr. Ludwig Revitz, a PAHO advisor for health research and management based in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ludovic. Uh, thank you very much, Rufus, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we are going to have today uh, four presentations. The first presentation is going to be focusing on the international experience in the clinical management of COVID. Then we are going to have three presentations that are going to focus on the clinical management of patients in the Eastern Caribbean. So our first uh, speaker is Dr. Mark Cortepper. Uh, Mark is a colonel and U.S. Army retired. Um, he is a physician, a scientist, a soldier, and an author. Uh, he has ex extensive experience at the hospital, research, lab, and also an academic research and as an academic. He's currently a professor of epidemiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and director of the Special Pathogens Research Network. Uh, Mark is going to present, as I said, uh, the international experience in clinical management. He's going to cover his, he's having a very comprehensive uh, presentation that covers uh, epidemiological aspects, uh, clinical aspects, uh, the risk of complications, the service response, and also pharmaceutical and research. So, Mark, uh, please. 
Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ludovic. Are you, uh, can everybody hear me? We can hear you and also see the, the presentation. You have the floor. Over. Perfect. All right. I will try not to be too long because I want to make sure we get to the other presenters and I've reduced some of my slides just for that reason. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Trouble advancing the slide. Hold on. Meanwhile, just to make sure that we're recording the presentation. Uh, uh, we are recording recording the presentations, and both the presentations and the recordings will be made available after the meeting. And uh, Dr. Coder Peter, uh, probably it's because you need to use page up and page down on your. There was some kind of an editing function that popped up on my screen when they did the recording, and now I can't get rid of it. Just a second. Can you try to press ask to see if it works? Yeah, I can't get rid of it. I tried to. Um, Maybe that did it. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All right, so just uh, briefly, where are we with the epidemiology around the world? So, as you can see here, um, this overview of just, uh, this is from the WHO just a couple of days ago, showing the different parts of the world. And you can see, uh, if you look here in terms of numbers on the y-axis and then dates on the x-axis, you can see very early on here, hopefully you can see my pointer. You see the peak uh, that we had in China early on, of course, that's been dwarfed as this whole uh, outbreak has progressed around the world. And we saw this very nice exponential rise, which is very common for any outbreak. I'd say we're kind of at a stabilization phase in terms of overall numbers. As you can see, we, we're not quite on a downswing yet across the Americas. Um, and then we are starting to see what looks like a decline across Europe. Uh, and then the Eastern Mediterranean is about stable. <clears throat> so this is just uh, looking at hotspots in the recent, uh, you know, last seven days where there's the most new cases reported. You can see United States continues to lead the world really as the, the, the hottest spot. And then other parts, though, are also significantly still in, have increases in cases. Now, Canada, places like Brazil, uh, across Russia, India, Turkey, uh, et cetera. So I think you all know by now the fundamental problem with this really is the fact that it's highly transmissible with, with the population without any underlying immunity. The fact that it, it affects certain populations more severely than others and then you bring these two together, especially without any really good countermeasures, at least the full impact. So what have some places done in terms of operational response? I think, unfortunately, one of the challenges we've seen is despite what was going on early in China and the fact that they were locking down their country, uh, it was hard to get other places to start thinking about this strategically and preparing. Um, and so if you look at the Italian experience when they had their first case, they looked at creating cohorts of ICUs, organizing triage areas where they would put mechanical and ventilation in the triage area, um, and then assessing their triage protocols, looking at PPE availability. And um, But the problem is, uh, even with that, they were astounded by how rapidly they had a surge in cases and the number of people requiring ICU beds such that it nearly collapsed their healthcare system, at least in the northern part of Italy. Um, this is a report out of one of the New York hospitals where what they did was similarly, where they took, set up tents outside the facility near the emergency room and they had to split their triage so they could evaluate cases with less acute illness versus more acute illness uh, simultaneously to make, make a little more efficient and they also had to have ventilators available in the emergency ward to prepare for the fact that some patients were coming in. And one of the challenges is people are afraid to go to the hospital now, so they're waiting 
sometimes too long and they're showing up and having to be intubated very quickly or they're severely ill. And what they found is they sent about 70% of people home and they admitted about 30%, but then 10% uh, of those admitted needed immediate ICU and ventilators and about 15% needed to go to the ICU within two days of admission. So these people who are being admitted are pretty sick. Um, they've had to expand ICU beds and essentially turn their whole setup of ICUs, in, you know, medical intensive care, surgical, step down unit, et cetera, become essentially COVID ICUs. Um, and then they've had full floors that are solely for COVID patients. Uh, and then they've changed the way they do personal protective equipment. Instead of what we're nor normally used to doing, you go into a patient room and then just before you go in, you put on your personal protective equipment. What they've been doing is the entire hospital, once they go into the hospital, the hospital starting to wear their PPE. And they've had, at one point, they were recruiting uh, retired clinicians to have care for some of the four patients. So this is an article not too long ago that came out of another New York hospital looking at the things they did, looking at what are the various challenges and, uh, and then, you know, things like decision in debate, how to standardize um, uh, clinical activities, education to care providers, handling the surge, and then some of the things they did as solutions. I'm not going to read through these, but I, I have this as a reference, so if anybody wants to look uh, later, they can find the reference and look at these up in detail for your uh, locations. I will say epidemiologically, some of the uh, countries across the Caribbean, places like Guadeloupe, Martinique, were hit fairly early on with uh, with cases. It appears to be in some of those places things are leveling out. I think the important thing for the countries that maybe haven't had as many cases is to just be aware that as things start loosening up across the world, uh, there's, it is possible to have such a surge in cases, even if you haven't had that uh, thus far. So let's look at some clinical aspects. So this is data out of China from a number of different studies. And basically this has not changed. Patients are primarily presenting with constellation of fever, dyspnea, chest tightness, and a cough, possibly with sputum, most commonly without, and then other things like uh, rhinorrhea or sore throat, or upper, other upper respiratory type symptoms are less common. Some individuals also having, you know, some gastrointestinal, either nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea complaints. And we've seen this borne out over and over again. So this is the U.S. data. Similarly, fever, chills, shortness of breath, myalgia, diarrhea, the top common symptoms. And so these are the things to be looking for. Of course, we also are aware that some patients can be either asymptomatic or be shedding virus in the pre-symptomatic phase, which has been a challenge for controlling this, uh, the spread especially. And early on, there's really not anything to tell you for sure this is COVID. One thing that may help is a low lymphocyte count. Uh, other things maybe uh, start to come up early, like a C-reactive protein here, or uh, even potentially fibrinogen or something like that, D-dimer. But those may not be as common early on, but certainly later they become very common as people are severely ill. So who is at highest risk of complications? This is based on some early data, but it's still fairly well borne out that uh, the majority of patients are gonna have mild illness, but then you have about 20% that are gonna be more severely ill, 15% or so need some type of care in a hospital, where they, whether it's just be something like, uh, you know, some oxygen for a couple of days just to get them through the worst phase. Uh, but then you have this 5% or so that, re, you know, require ICU care and then and have more severe illness going into septic shock or multi-organ failure, uh, rest, uh, renal failure, et cetera, and then requiring, uh, in some cases, intubation. And you can see the, the age distribution here for hospitalization. Mostly children have been fairly well spared, but then we see this staircase uh, in terms of numbers per population, and it really just keeps climbing as people get older. And then similarly, this has been shown originally in China and then every other country that I've seen that those with underlying conditions, especially things like hypertension, obesity, diabetes, chronic lung disease, uh, and cardiovascular disease, these are the ones at highest risk, not only for hospitalization, but also for death. And this shows you the death rates from 5,700 patients out of New York City. Here again on the left, 
can say male and female separated, but you can see the, uh, the rates as these individuals get older in terms of death rates. And the other thing that's been common is that males in most of the reviews appear to be, uh, have a higher death rate than females by a little bit. Interestingly, there've been some reports originally out of Europe but then recently in New York City about children uh, with some type of new inflammatory syndrome. Um, I have not seen any published case series yet, and uh, and it's uh, hard to say because not all the cases, at least in this report of 15 cases, not all of them are actually positive. So two thirds of them pose it positive in some way for coronavirus, either by PCR or antibodies. But they do have elevated markers of inflammation as well as other features, uh, sort of a blend of Kawasaki's and toxic shock syndrome, where they're having fever. Some of them are having rashes, abdominal pain, vomiting, or diarrhea, and some of them uh, reports of even um, acute cardiac arrest. Uh, so this is something to just be aware of uh, and on the lookout for. And of course, Kawasaki's occurs around this time of year in the spring and summer, usually in more, uh, more commonly in Asian children, uh, as well as um, usually uh, males more than females, but uh, just something to be aware of. Uh, in case you see it, maybe it's linked to uh, coronavirus. So what can you expect? Well, I think what we've seen historically and what continues to be seen is that individuals will come in, they may have a normal chest x-ray early on and they may not that be, be that ill, uh, but near the end of the first week, they can become more severely ill and actually then their CT scan, which might show some ground glass appearance in various places becomes uh, severely uh, and individuals who can become severely ill requiring intensive care, potentially ventilator support. And you can see here whiting out of uh, multi lobar areas in the lungs. And then at the same time, we will see then individuals with cytokine storm with elevated markers like CRP, ferritin, LDH, uh, interleukin 6, and D dimer. So some of the things that I've seen, uh, that I've seen based on a review of 19 reviews of reviews. Uh, really, same, same thing, you know, increased age, comorbid conditions as shown there in the common laboratory. So this appears to be uh, uh, fairly well described at this point. So what do we have for management? Well, there's no specific magic bullet. I'll talk a little bit about that, but what places are doing, trying to be judicious about fluid management, generally trying to run patients dry. Uh, potentially giving trials of antibiotics and then stopping it based on cultures. Uh, inotropes as needed with a recommendation toward norepinephrine first and trying to be conservative with PEEP if possible uh, to increase some of the uh, ventilation perfusion uh, matching to uh, have patients prone if needed if they have refractory hypoxemia. Uh, and then many patients are requiring dialysis. It's generally recommended to avoid steroids. Um, but we've seen an evolution in the management. So many sites uh, early on were giving chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Uh, and that seems to have fallen down the wayside as there's been more concern about toxicity. Lopinavir, uh, rotinavir was something that was looked at by the Chinese. It does not appear to be beneficial. But places are still using lots of things as sort of last ditch efforts for severely ill patients like IL-6 blockers, JAK inhibitors, you know, basically trying to go after this inflammatory process and with these anti-inflammatory monoclonal antibodies. Um, and then some are even using steroids. The latest I've seen is high-dose famotidine, which is a, you know, a pepsid, uh, but they're using it at higher doses. And it, this is just based on one individual who was well-connected, who went to uh, China and was working with some Chinese colleagues and noticed that uh, some of the poor individuals were doing better than the the wealthy because they were taking cheap drugs and one of them was famotidine and so somehow that got back and and so people started trying to use this i haven't seen any data on it i think it's being studied uh, and then most recently actually this paper just came out yesterday i think um looking at this is from a new york hospital uh, where they're looking at how did people do if they actually got full coagulation it appears that uh full coagulation may be beneficial in terms of uh, uh the um, you know, median survival being 21 days versus 14 days on those full dose and actually appeared to be even better in individuals if they required mechanical and ventilation, mechanical ventilation. So this is certainly something to look at 
uh, potentially in the future to see if we see other things uh, confirming this. One of my colleagues, Andre Khalil, says the administration of any unproven drug as a last resort wrongly assumes that the benefit will be more likely than the harm. And I think that's some of what we've seen along the way here as new ideas pop up. Based on very limited uh, data, people have been reaching for just about anything because they want to try to save lives. And, and uh, But sometimes you just have to be mindful that the, the, be the benefit may not be uh, better than the harm. Uh, and I could just sort of use the example of West Africa here with the graveyard of Ebola drugs that were used for similar purposes just because we were desperate and most things didn't pan out. So one example here is hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. So there been, were a number of different studies early on, uh, potentially showing may, maybe some minor benefit. The point that uh, the FDA even approved an uh, expanded use authorization on March 28th, but it wasn't uh, even one month later, they, they issued a new caution against using this, especially outside a hospital clinical trial, just because the concerns about dysrhythmias and toxicity. Now, the, the, uh, the latest information is related to remdesivir. There have been a couple different studies out there. One was compassionate use, uh, so there were no controls, but they, it appeared to provide benefit when compared to some historical data out of China. Uh, and then the Chinese had a randomized placebo-controlled study. Unfortunately, it only enrolled about a third of what they needed, but they ran out of patients. But overall, it did not appear to be a difference uh, in terms of time to clinical improvement and those treated versus untreated. However, when they looked at uh, breakdown, those given it before 10 days of illness versus after, it appeared to be a trend toward benefit. Um, but uh, most recently, there's a randomized placebo-controlled trial that just was had its uh, initial information released after the Data Safety Monitoring Board looked at it. It appeared to show 31% uh, faster time to recovery of 11 versus 15 days and a trend toward lower mortality. For all full, full visibility, I was part of that trial. I run a network with 10 centers, all of which were participated and provided 28% of the cases uh, for that. But this was probably the only real ray of hope we've had uh, uh, recently about any potential pharmacologic effect other than potentially also this uh, anticoagulation effect. So there are numerous drug uh, trials going on. I uh, looked up on the WHO recently uh, website, uh, over 2,100 clinical trials, looking at various things, some of these immune modulators, convalescent plasma, various ways to uh, provide uh, oxygen when uh, there's hypoxemia. And then the WHO has a solidarity protocol that they started early on looking at uh, trying to compare local standard of care versus standard of care plus one of four uh, specific agents. And uh, these are the agents they've been looking at. It's possible to get participate in that through, uh, through WHO for sites that are interested in doing that. It made the process very simple. There are also trials going on for vaccines. Uh, there are phase one trials going on uh, and um, I noticed 16 different trials Things that are being looked at include mRNA vaccines, as well as BCG, as well as uh, some type of viral vector using the recombinant S protein as the antigen from the virus. And then lots of other things in the works in uh, preclinical testing in animals. Uh, we'll see where this goes. A lot of things are trying to be accelerated and, uh, um, and uh, it, you know, it's just a matter of time. It takes time to go through this and it's probably a long time, I would say, before we actually have a a vaccine that we know is effective as well as safe. So WHO has been involved in this effort, harnessing the global coalition, trying to map out vaccine candidates and where they are in the world, defining the characteristics for safe and effectiveness, and uh, and then coordinating clinical trials across the world. There's more on their websites down there. So just as I come to a close, there is a document put together. Um, by PAHO looking at uh, recommendations on critical care of serious patients with this. In addition, there's a triage uh, protocol here shown and on this other website shown below where it breaks it down into sort of a triage uh, piece of uh, assessment followed by isolation uh, part of this and then, and then a referral in terms of refer into the hospital, refer somewhere else for care, et cetera. And we're actually actively looking at this and we're kind of reconfiguring it um, based on uh, the data that we can find from reviews on the management. So in summary, this disease spreads 
highly efficiently, which is part of the problem, is a wide range of illness with certain individuals, especially the elderly and those with comorbid conditions uh, who have a specific higher risk of severe illness. Children are fairly well spared, but you know we're learning more about this every day, and so it's a rapidly moving target in terms of what to expect. We still don't really have the best way to treat it. Perhaps remdesivir is helpful, but it's certainly not a magic bullet that's going to cure all. And if you haven't been overwhelmed yet, just be mindful that there is the risk as things start opening up, uh, as more and more movements start occurring, to be overwhelmed in terms of your ICU capacity, oxygen, ventilators, PPE, et cetera. So, and finally, healthcare workers are not immune. So, this is a review done by the CDC's MMWR over a space of a, uh, nearly a month, where they looked at healthcare workers, where they did respond in this uh, survey. Uh, you know, 19% of the overall were identified as healthcare workers, meaning the age of 42. And, uh, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, there were appeared to be um, 6,700 who, uh, <laughs> reported uh, reported illness and uh, and then unfortunately excuse me um, I'm losing track here but the bottom line is we had numerous individuals infected and then of those 10, 27 were actually uh, succumbed to the illness so healthcare workers we still have to be vigilant and watch out our own personal protective equipment I think that's all I have I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for this comprehensive presentation in such a short time. So uh, we are going to keep the, the discussion and the questions at the end of the four presentations. However, if you have specific questions, you can include those in the chat and we will read them uh, at the end. Otherwise, you can also uh, make your questions through the, you can also speak through the microphone. So our next presenter is uh, Dr. Michel Carles. Uh, Michel Carles uh, is a medical doctor and an anesthesiologist. He's also an infection disease specialist and a PhD. Uh, Michel is the head of the intensive care unit department at the University Hospital of Guadeloupe. Uh, please, Dr. Carles. Dr. Carles, good afternoon. You have the, the floor to share your content. Over. Yes, thank you. Do you hear me? We can hear you clearly and you also have access to... Yes, I'm trying to... Okay. Yes, we have it. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank sure. you for inviting me uh, to participate to this meeting. So I will try to give you an overview of how we manage in Guadeloupe uh, the, the, the COVID epidemic. Uh, Guadeloupe, which is a, a French uh, island with a, um, the healthcare system uh, like in France, and uh, a population of um, over um, 400,000 people, including the North Islands of Saint-Martin and Saint-Barthélemy. In terms of epidemiology, the main contamination sources in these islands are from cruises, um, including a lot of Italian tourists uh, coming from the, the north of Italy, which was one of the main clusters in Europe and also French citizens from the Paris area uh, with a first identified case uh, of a 43 years old man in Saint Barthélemy Island having symptoms of COVID and a posi positive PCR on February 28th. Then the first hospitalized, hospitalized case was March 13th and the first case in the ICU March 15th in the University Hospital of Pointe-à-Pitre. So then the increase of cases in blue, the patients in the ICU uh, was uh, quick the first two weeks uh, and was 
uh, at the same time, uh, a decision of the French government to uh, do national and regional lockdown uh, starting March 17th. Uh, during the first two weeks, uh, we, we got cases doubling every week until we didn't know at the time. And then a plateau, and uh, now we are uh, ending the first wave uh, with a probable um, uh, no case in ICU uh, after four to six weeks after the plateau. Uh, the strategy uh, to test people was uh, over the first month period to screen only symptomatic people due to the lack of tests. Then we test more than 1,300 people and 17% uh, were positive. Uh, among them, 27% uh, hospitalized and uh, more than 10% in the ICU. So this number um, looks like a big, a, a bit high and uh, probably due to lack of uh, more um, uh, generalized testing in the island. And the main points of the epidemiological um, uh, part is that uh, the out-of-island contamination source, sources were uh, mainly due to a lack of entries and the lack of testing. The early lockdown was very efficient because uh, it, was, it was started in the island before the containment strategy was overwhelmed and uh, uh, able to decrease the, the reproduction number of infected people. And finally, um, the restricted screening to symptomatic people prevents to be able to see uh, the, the virus spreading over the island and probably increase the severity ratio as uh, reported by the percentage of hospitalized people over the uh, positive people. So the uh, operational response we, we have done in Guadeloupe uh, was uh, as follow. Uh, the, before the crisis, the ICU, which is mainly the, 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 the only one in the island, uh, has uh, 30 beds. Uh, the first level response was to open dedicated beds uh, among those beds, those uh, 30 beds, four, then seven, then 12 uh, COVID dedicated beds. The second level was to open a new unit of eight beds uh, for COVID units. So after two weeks, we moved from 30 to 38 beds uh, ICU, including uh, 20 COVID dedicated beds. Uh, this area were uh, restricted areas re recommended. We, we were not able to uh, have uh, negative air pressure uh, rooms. Uh, because we only have two, and uh, this recommendation was cancelled later. Uh, early, our um, approach was airborne precaution because we didn't know what level of risk we have to face, but uh, uh, quickly later, we go to droplet precaution except for airway management. Uh, the plan was organized to uh, respond to uh, a bigger uh, threat with a plan uh, going to 38 COVID beds in the ICU until 52 at the end in case of a major uh, epidemic. But uh, this plan was never implemented because the, the uh, as I show you, uh, the cases were uh, slowing down uh, after the two first week. So the reality action we did uh, to respond to the, the epidemic was to uh, cancel all scheduled surgery and to uh, put the anesthesia machine in the ICU to help to um, ventilate patients, to um, quickly um, uh, organize uh, ICU training for nurse, nurses with short training program, which are a 15 days program uh, which is too short, but uh, because uh, we think that uh, there is no more time uh, to uh, train new nurses and we need them, uh, we do those uh, short training programs. Uh, another point was to organize a daily bibliography to make all the medical staff aware of new information about this unknown uh, disease. 
And finally, we organize daily short remote meeting with infectious disease, emergency, emergency disease specialists, as well as uh, hygiene and administration staff to uh, coordinate the hospital response. Uh, at the end, uh, a weekly pharmacist intensivist meeting was required for drug issue, uh, as we will talk a little bit later. So some specific issue we have to face and the first one was uh, in terms of team management, how to fight against the fear. And at the beginning of the epidemic, it was a big, big issue for us. And initially, three uh, uh, medical doctors were infected. So uh, nurses in the ICU and as well in all the hospital overstate the transmission-based precaution with a, a major use of PPE. Uh, leading to a PPE shortage in N95. We, we call this FFP2 mask in France and the garden and other um, resources. So uh, a, a significant effort was done on education and information of the healthcare workers. And we are uh, quite uh, satisfied that uh, no nurse were infected in the ICU. So uh, what the human resources response for us, it was the Plan Blanc, which is the emergency plan, plan in hospitals in France, uh, making the hospital able to cancel all vacation for nurse and MD and to um, schedule rest for the, the teams to be able to work uh, for a long period of time and also to provide free housing to avoid family contamination. Uh, for healthcare workers. Um, another specific issue was how to deal with patients' family. At the start, zero visits were um, allowed and uh, it was um, quickly a big problem for everybody, for the, the, the medical team and for the families and for some patients also. So, but uh, for dying people as well as for a uh, long-term ICU stay, this position was not sustainable. And then we finally organized um, a plan like one day, one patient, one relative, three times a week, making able to uh, uh, go to visit their parents on a shift basis between units. So not too much people coming to the hospital, and but the, the link between the, the patient and his family is not uh, uh, not broken. So in terms of clinical management issue, uh, the main uh, issue is the severe pneumonia, and but I would say that no major practices changes were done. Um, we try to avoid the intubation each time it was possible using high flow oxygen mask and non-invasive ventilation. We, we were given to severe pneumonia systematic antibiotics. Anticoagulation, as uh, told Dr. Uh, Kortepeter, is a major concern and we quite early started to uh, give anticoagul anticoagulation to the patient. We, I will talk a, a little bit about later. And we started to give on a compassionate mood a treatment, a cure uh, uh, with azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. So about steroid, we started as recommended by the Infectious Disease uh, Society in France. We started to uh, treat patients with steroid. Uh, for patients with uh, same first symptoms for more than eight days and a severe pneumonia on people having uh, uh, patent inflammation, evident inflammation with a bacterial infection absent or treated and uh, e eventually with sign of fibrosis. And the, the protocol was metinprednisolone, as you can uh, read here. So for the uh, azithromycin hydroxychloroquine cure, uh, was it uh, for uh, it was for the perspective, but uh, I, uh, we are not sure now that it's still uh, the same uh, because if in ventilated patient, we got 54, 55 percent of tests compared to 65 in Chinese cohort, but the safety issue is a real problem and 
as you can see on the uh, um, corrected QT uh, of the patient, there is um, an increase, especially in ventilated patients, of the QT with people having uh, an increase of more than uh, 20% uh, increase of the uh, baseline QT. So there is a potential slight benefit um, of the of this treatment uh, the, because of QT issues, we stopped the treatment and we are now waiting for additional info about uh, this treatment. So another specific issue for us in the in the epidemic was the drug shortage uh, for very important drugs for midazolam and all muscle relaxants and how uh, can we um, treat uh, IRDS without such a drug. It was kind of tricky and we, we go to old uh, drugs like uh, ketamine, which is not so old in, in terms of use, but also pentotal and other drugs to try to uh, get the best for the patient without uh, these drugs. But actually, uh, the shortage was uh, not so long, and uh, we are now with uh, all drugs we need. So uh, for practices changes, finally, not that much. Uh, we still uh, treat IRDS, severe ideas with prone ventilation. Uh, as for severe influenza, we, we went to uh, the ECMO option for two patients and the two survived. So we are waiting for more information of, of, about this option and it seems to be interesting. More uh, frequent indication of steroid for sure at our level. We think that uh, it can help uh, a lot of patients uh, if you uh, started uh, the steroids at the right time. Uh, for acute thrombosis, this is a big challenge of this disease, and I, I won't say more about it. And so for us, it's more about resources than practices changes uh, that we, we have to work on. And uh, uh, obviously, we are awaiting specific treatment of the disease. So thank you, and um, I hope the, the slides were uh, readable. Uh, Dr. Carles, thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting uh, presentation on, uh, on the response that you have been doing. Our next presenter is Dr. Cory Ford. He's a medical doctor and a specialist in infectious diseases. He, he is currently the head of the Infection Prevention and Control and Infection Disease Programs at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Barbados. He's also currently Chair of Infection Prevention and Control and Director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. Uh, please, Dr. Forgi, you have the floor. Dr. Ford, you have the floor. I gave you access through the um, under the name Dr. Corey Ford. Is this the one you are using? Yes, I'm using that one. I'm just trying to okay to upload the uh, where do I find it? Where do I find the upload to upload my uh, presentation? So, on the on the bottom, you have the microphone, the video, and then you have another um, uh, icon that it's a um, up arrow. You click on this, okay. and it will give you oh, yeah. the uh, share content or share file. Yes, it's a plug right there. Uh, just a second. It seems it's uploaded, but it's um, it's blank. Go. 
Uh, I think there are some microphones that are open. If you can, yes, I just close. Okay. And um, if you are having problems to, to upload, if you want to send it to me, I can try to upload from here. Okay, perfect. If you send it to me. So in the meantime, um, if you have any questions and comments, please feel feel free to use the the chat. And we will try to address all the comments over. Sanjo. Just, just a second. Now, now we can now we can see. Okay, so okay, good. so I just need you to um, use yes, and I think now we can see. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to first thank everyone for giving uh, my, me this opportunity to do this uh, on behalf of Barbados. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to try to show you some of the, the aspects which we have to face within the country, uh, which is not dissimilar from uh, many of the comments that have been made before. Um, this is a joint presentation by myself and the intensivist, uh, Dr. Amri Hassel, and not to uh, Andrea Lovell, and there will be online to ask, and you can ask any other questions uh, that I may not be able to answer. Um, so. Uh, uh, I'm going to look at and give you an idea of the epidemiologic situation in Barbados and what are the what was the operational response to COVID-19 in Barbados. Um, it's kind of looking at clinical management and what sort of challenges that we face and what sort of factors shape our practice in management and what we kind of want to look for towards the future. So this is really some of the faces of COVID in Barbados since our first case on the 16th of March uh, 2020. And really, uh, if you think about uh, our response in country, it really had to do with the sort of leadership on the ground. And I think one of the things that we learned as we went through the outbreak is that the importance of teamwork and the sort of resilience that that brought um, to the floor. So you had a variety of different individuals on the ground uh, from, the, from the head of the country um, down to some very key individuals um, at all levels um, working together um, in the outbreak. And the operational response really was structured from the level of government involving all ministries our social partnership as well was very well involved and the Ministry of Health at the level of the uh, Health Emergency Operations Center really uh, operated the whole response in country in terms of surveillance testing on the full infrastructure. Uh, we had a structure of a, a, a CESAR, a czar, sorry, at the National Coordinator of, of Quarantine and Isolation as we looked through our system and the incident command at the level of the hospital was also important, uh, which led to development of a, a a unit um, within our emergency department system, which I'll talk about later. Uh, the clinical management was then operated um, through operational documents um, and, of course, with external conf uh, consultation. I think one of the most important things uh, I would have learned is the importance of a team response. Um, and then, of course, to have a very structured communication structure. From the beginning, the communication structure was always going to come through our government information service so that we controlled um, the sort of information um, um, which went out and made sure that it was appropriate. So when we think about operational response, think about stuff and space. So initially, we had a six-bedded unit at our MR facility, which had the capacity to do our intensive care unit. Uh, and then we had a 30-bed unit uh, plus at our Paragon base uh, um, uh, uh, military facility. Now, the, quickly after that, and our cases begin to increase, and I'll give you some more information about that shortly, but we converted the school within a 40, 48 hour period. This is a picture here um, of what we developed in a 48 hour period. Um, we developed a 120 bed uh, uh, unit within the school um, system. Um, and that, and we also had the capacity in that school to have a high dependency unit, which we did um, utilize. 
Um, during that period of time, um, the government made a decision to expand its capacity, given what was going on globally, and, and really um, looking at the sort of search that could occur in Barbados and looking at the sort of figures, um, it was decided that we will expand this into a Harrison's Point facility, which is now our premier facility housing um, all of our patients. That facility has a 38-bed ICU um, capacity with full ventilation capacity, is negative pressure, fully negative pressure. Um, followed by another a segment of that intensive care can take it up to about another 42 beds and the tertiary quarters, uh, which can manage between mild to moderate cases. So you might imagine this is really a Herculean task for us um, as we went through the system. This is a, a picture here of our Harrison's, new Harrison's Point facility. So, like I said before, the most important thing um, when, we, when we were thinking about management of the patient, the initial response was to have an operational team, operational response team um, to COVID, um, um, which occurs, we, we call it Campus 2, which is our MR facility, uh, which was set up for these uh, critically ill patients. Um, and as you can see, I think a very important point to make from this picture is we all work together. So, doctors, some doctors will mop floors, help carbonize walls. Um, uh, uh, housekeeping will obviously um, be, be, be involved there, um, nursing. So we had uh, really uh, taken down in this COVID response, this whole idea of, of definition of duties according to whether you're a nurse, doctor, et cetera. So the, as you well know, the World Health Organization really defines what the aspects are in terms of clinical management and what are some of the key considerations here. And, and, and clearly with the time I have, I, I definitely cannot go through all of these particular aspects. But what I will seek to do is to try to get across to you some of the key aspects um, that led um, uh, or uh, led to the, to, the, to the appropriate management of patients from our end. And it's important in that aspect to really define um, Category. So we said mild illnesses. So that's uncomplicated upper respiratory tract infections, moderate pneumonias, pneumonias uh, without the need for supplementary oxygen, and severe pneumonia, pneumonia with dyspnea, respiratory distress, um, and there with PF ratio of less than 300. And those we consider to be critically ill who had respiratory failure, septic shock, and, uh, and multi organ failure. So what was really going on in the ground in Barbados? So we had a total of 83 cases. I mentioned before that our first case was on the 16th of March. Um, Barbados has a population of 290,000 um, people. Um, and we had 30% uh, of the cases admitted to the intensive care unit. So what was the, the type of structure that, uh, in terms of, of cases? So it fits well with, and if you compare um, the slides here from China, and certainly ours from Barbados, when you look at mild to moderate cases, our predominant amount of cases out of those 83 cases, um, as of this morning, um, was really um, mild uh, to moderate in, in nature, so not requiring that type of ICU admission. Um, the severe cases were about 4.9% of the total population, and the critical cases about 6.1%. 6, 6 so not quite um, dissimilar, certainly, from the mild to moderate cases of what one was seeing on the national, national line. If we then compare what's happening in the U.S., and noting that our numbers are quite much smaller, um, in the US, and we look at our case fatality and look at that in terms of our age groups, you will see it trends almost the same as one was seen um, in the US. So our, our larger amount of deaths, of the seven deaths that we've had, have really occurred in the older population. And not only in the older population, but people with uh, comorbidities. And the, what were those comorbidities? So uh, it's quite difficult to, to make a conclusion, a full conclusion on this slide, I think, I mean, quite early on. But of those seven deaths, the majority of them, um, um, almost all of them, um, had um, diabetes. Um, and hypertension was another big player. The other players, of course, uh, were cancer, hypothyroidism, and BPS were certain diabetes. And that really follows uh, the trend or what really is on the floor in Barbados in terms of the, the sort of um, non-communicable disease that we see. So we had to make local decisions and management decisions and choices based on what was going on in the global stage, but of course, based on what we had on the ground. So we all know, as was discussed before, we have no specific antiviral treatment recommended. Uh, we have no clinical um, specific management, but supportive care, and that's what we were going to offer. And uh, the current clinical treatment was basically based on our experience, as we well know for SARS and MERS, but of course that was subject to change. We have the capacity, as I mentioned before, for respiratory and circulatory support. But we also have to take into context the sort of challenges uh, that will be faced across the country if we had a large, because Barbados has a very large population, 
of elderly people. If we had a large uh, amount of them um, infected, we have would have to have made um, some 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 decisions. And so um, these sort of things were discussed at the level of the hospital in anticipation of these events at the the ethics committee across the hospital and across the country. So discussion. Um, luckily for us, we only had three uh, ventilated patients. The uh, looked at the physical and human resources across the country. So we uh, we got some help from the Cubans um, who are still on the ground. Um, our ICU nurses, we noted, were limited, and we took the opportunity to expand our training into those in country who are aligned with the army. So the army played a very important role um, in, the, in in this response. What were the challenges? So we noticed obviously everyone um, certainly online knows that there are challenges in global personal protective equipment. It is something that in Barbados we did not have a huge challenge with because I think we acted quite quickly and getting as much of these resources as we could on the ground. But we, we also had to look at how we would use these, these, these equipments on the ground based on standard um, WHO and, 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 and CDC's um, definitions. Um, how we would use them and when we would use them. It was important to get across to the staff. I noted the last speaker and he gave an example of the challenges which he's had with staff in with regards to this and use of personal protective equipment. And I, I dare tell him there was no difference. Laboratory challenges, what were they? So uh, for a small, a small country uh, with a, a, a very a one hospital uh, with, with really all of our laboratories uh, stuff happened in that hospital, it was really a challenge. Um, and uh, we have not, we've now fixed it, but at the initial stages, we had significant challenges in terms of getting um, some of the laboratory tests that we would have loved to have, uh, we meant, as mentioned by my, my previous, the previous speaker. Um, we, we use a more point of care type system um, within our facilities. Of course, there were challenges in specialties. So we had not had any pediatric patients, thankfully so, um, but we had to look at how we would would gauge issues with in pediatrics and surgery and obstetrics. And the idea was um, um, done by the anesthetic group and the emergency um, ambulance service um, led capably, capably um, and the emergency staff to look at how we would move patients, how we will deal with these particular aspects, whether it be the surgical department, the obstetrics department, the pediatric department. And I think it was very important very early on um, that the guys were able to look at various scenarios. As you can see here, um, it looks at both procedural and transportation issues, noting that patients would have to move from our, our, our general hospital um, to another facility uh, to be managed as I shown before. And it was therefore important to take ourselves through the process of how this would happen. Um, so Dr. Williams uh, and Dr. Bayer um, and the anesthetic team were able to take, take you through or walk you through what are the sort of complications that can happen on the way to that facility if people were intubated or they were intubated. Um, they were able to look at the obstetrics component, um, what might be some of the challenges that might be faced. And of course, the neonatologists were, were quite interested in how things might um, we would be able to maneuver things in the face of COVID. So if you look at the early supportive, of supportive therapy and monitoring, so um, oxygen, of course, um, <laughs> we put the, the, um, uh, most of the patients on, if not all of them who went to the intensive care um, setting. Uh, we did uh, more of weight proning because um, I mentioned before we only had three ventilated patients. Uh, we used low flow oxygen and oxygen um, 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 by our face mask. And it was a bit easier to manage this form of patient than it was the ventilated patient because obviously they were, they were awake. We thought chest physio and certainly we had x-rays and everyone who came in, which was another challenge initially, but that, that was started quite quickly. Uh, and we, we, we focused on conservative fluid therapy Imperate antibiotic therapy, um, which included as a tromycin in the initial regime. Um, and um, we didn't use steroids, as my farm, as my, my previous um, guest has said, and we closely monitored for signs of deterioration. And all the patients um, who were alert and awake were offered a psychological assessment. I think this becomes a very important aspect that we often don't think about for people in isolation. So here's a nice flow chart of how we uh, uh, actually operated. So our COVID. Um, 19 patients with hypoxia. Uh, they had indications for intubation. That intubation was specifically only done um, by the anesthesiologists who were trained um, using all the various techniques that they need to use um, with the appropriate um, personal protective equipment. And we minimized the amount of staff in the room for those procedures. Um, if that was not required, we often give high flow oxygen. We didn't have the capacity to give um, um, high flow nasal cannulation, but this is the approach that we took. 
Um, and if there was an indication for intubation, um, we often consider a very, uh, very early on um, using NIPPB. Our targets for oxygenation um, were not uh, what you might expect. Normally, somewhere between 92 to 96 was quite favorable. And we would, I, I take pains to note that most of the patients who were prone to those ones who were not intubated actually did very, very well uh, and were released from, from the process. So if you give you a summary of uh, hypoxic respiratory failure and ARDS and what we did, early referral to ICU um, arms were made from the isolation centers if people got ill. Um, Barbados's position is that we were going to, all patients were going to be on the isolation. I think that that was actually um, 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 quite important. I think the challenges um, in that process um, certainly was from, and I heard you speakers saying this is important, that people early in the, in the disease process, the ones who actually did bad, badly or, or were involved in our mortality were people who actually presented the healthcare system quite late with the disease. Mechanical ventilation uh, with low flow oxygen and ventilation care was very important. And I mentioned it, what we did in terms of pronin. So the general things we, we considered important. So trying to reduce the amount of days on ventilation, trying to reduce the incidence of associated pneumonia, of which we had a case or two, and reduce the incidence of, 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 of VTE. Of course, um, reducing the incidence of pressure ulcers and all distress ulcers and GI bleeding and the, the various agents used alone in that processes um, were considered. So what were complications? So the, the globe gives an idea of what complications um, that people commonly face. But for us in Barbados, pneumonia, um, certainly from the beginning, and we did uh, start almost all of our patients at antibiotics. Um, um, altered metastasis was quite interesting. So especially in the younger population who were ill, they presented with a lot of, of altered metastasis for the small amount of numbers which we had. This is in terms of the amount um, of people, of positive cases. Um, we had a case of hematuria, the presence of, of BPH, and acute kidney injury is only seen in about two of our patients. Um, and one patient had gram negative sex. This is important um, to note that she cleared um, her disease as by our protocol um, quite, um, quite, quite early and repeated, we actually repeated the test again after that and she was still negative. So I think her outcome um, was really from a ventilated associated pneumonia. So nothing, there's nothing more important than strategy. Um, and I think minimizing entry of into patient rooms was one of the strategies for as, as long as we possibly can. Um, I think it was important in terms of communication. So there was a communication between the nurses on the outer part and the inner part of all the our, our facilities um, via our uh, intercom system. And in some cases with patients who were more ambulant um, with um, um, via actual walkie talkies. Um, we use a Wi-Fi system to send um, uh, messages uh, to patients and patients were able all the facilities um, had appropriate Wi-Fi so they can communicate with their families, but also um, allowed us to communicate with other physicians, our psychologists, for example, uh, as well as the psychiatrists from the outside for people who had underlying um, clinical depression or we thought was leaning in that direction. Um, the cluster of, we tried to cluster tasks. I think these things you might think in terms of management are not important, but it's actually quite important that you cluster your tasks, meal times, et cetera, and limit the amount of specimen collection time. So they're very set. Um, uh, specimen collection times. Um, we reduced the amount of hospitality and housekeeping. We made it into a more structured setting so that um, when people went in, um, all of these individuals went in at, at one time. And so the doctors, nurses, whoever in were able to help these other aspects um, of services on the inside. Noting what I said before that we made a special attempt um, in, in the process of managing these patients not to specify people according to what your job title was. So patients and families were connected by phones, um, by iPads. Um, they had full internet access, as I mentioned before. And I think the simulation exercises, as this, they're still continuing to date, um, would play a very important part in how we respond in the other aspects of the disease. So staff aspects, it, it becomes important in terms of patient management as well. We had a large um, 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 cohort of staff who were well-trained in terms of IPC. But that does not mean there was not fear, there was not uncertainty, and there are still a lot of unknown aspects um, to this disease. Um, and I think um, working together, we were able to achieve uh, much um, in terms of adhering to the IPC policies. Staff were, were subject, not subject, I know we we'll use the word subject here, but they were, were asked for to, to, if they wanted to, 
to have a um, psychological assessment. What we've done it, we've done it excluding myself as a group, um, but we've also done it individually um, because of the challenges, of course, with this disease. Um, social partnerships and donors played a very important part. Um, we see some ventilators over there from our own home, Grom Rihanna. Um, and government and institutional support became important uh, on the ground for staffing. So other key aspects included in uh, environmental clean waste management and linen management um, under death protocol, um, which became extremely important. How you inform um, um, family members is going to be a bit different. And then the, we also had to then link that to uh, uh, what would happen at the level of the hospital um, um, in terms of, of dealing with deaths. So as I come to the end of my presentation, I just wanted to really mention something here. Um, the sort of uh, 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 in-country uh, look at what has happened. If you look at this picture, you see to the patients and staff of Happy Asians during Easter period. And if I told you that came from um, the school which we set up, and, and it didn't come from the school, but it actually came from people in the neighborhood, um, and the kids in the neighborhood who got together um, to make this both for the staff uh, and for the patient. I think that speaks well to where I started out, where I started out speaking in terms of um, the sort of unity, the sort of teamwork, um, not only now at a facility level, but at a country level. I just want to take um, the opportunity to thank um, all of those people, persons who stepped forward um, to help from the level of the, the, the governmental system, the EOC, the incident command, and staff at all isolation facilities, which work um, um, quite hard together. Um, and the, the ICU team, which absolutely were incredible, um, and um, the other um, individuals, Dr. Bell, Dr. Clark, um, and my own infection control um, um, team on the ground who worked uh, together during this outbreak. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ford. This was a, a very detailed and comprehensive presentation and uh, covers a uh, very interesting topic. In particular, I like it that you also included the maintaining staff spirit, which is something that it's uh, absolutely key. Our next presentation will be done by Dr. Hussein Medawi. Uh, Dr. Medawi is uh, currently, it's a medical doctor and anesthesiologist. He's also a surgical intensive care and critical care medicine certified uh, specialist. He's currently the head of the intensive care unit and the emergency department at the University Hospital of Martinique. Uh, please, Dr. Medawi, you have the floor. In the meantime, please uh, in, in, include your questions in the chat. We already have uh, many questions, uh, but we are organizing the questions, so you help us if you send us the questions during the presentation so you we can have some groups of of questions uh to organize everything thank you very much so good evening can, everybody. Hear me? can, can you hear me you, we can hear you and we can both see your presentation okay i would like to thank the panel for inviting me i'm very honored to be here uh first i would like to apologize because my Mother language is French. For, they have a rather poor English, but I do my best to be understood. Uh, one last thing I would like to say is that I'm not alone. I have a team with junior and senior doctors, uh, more than 200 nurses. And uh, at this time, uh, they are on the front line, and among them, uh, I think 75% of women. I would like that people don't forget them when all this mess will be over. So what happened in Martinique, this is the, the, the curve of our outbreak. As uh, you can see, uh, it's uh, started at the beginning of March. Uh, it increased until, I mean, the third week of March, and then the new cases decreased. Uh, and I hope uh, this will be the end of uh, this nightmare. But uh, what I can say today is that we have uh, we had about 180 uh, patients diagnosed with COVID-19, 
I don't know the, the exact number of, uh, of patients with COVID-19 in Martinique because uh, test, the methodology of the test was different uh, during the, the, the time. So this is the activity of the emergency department. As you can see, uh, it reached uh, quite 50 percent of the activity in the emergency department uh, during the third uh, week of, of March and decreased uh, with the time. So we had to make decision in order to face uh, this problem. What happened in critical care, it's uh, approximately the same. Uh, the lookout started on the second uh, week of March. It takes Three, three weeks uh, to reach the plateau. And then the, there is a decrease, but we have already seven patients uh, in the critical care unit uh, with three patients under mechanical ventilation. In summary, um, there's a, uh, we had 180 patients uh, diagnosed 101 hospitalized patients uh, in the University Hospital of Martinique, 42 uh, critical care patients, 14 deaths. Uh, most of them was uh, linked to not to resuscitate the orders. Uh, there's uh, something original here. We uh, used the, the SAMU, which is the pre hospital uh, emergency unit, uh, to follow up. Uh, patients suspected of uh, COVID-19 without uh, signs of severity. Uh, this is a very interesting approach because it allowed us to avoid overwhelming of the emergency uh, department uh, by COVID patients. So, uh, Patients could call uh, what we call the 15, which is like your 911. Uh, he can uh, speak to a medical doctor, uh, an evaluation of the severity of the case, and uh, he's uh, directed to the call center if uh, the medical doctor thinks it's not a severe case. Uh, otherwise, the patient will be uh, brought to the hospital by uh, an emergency or ambulance and there is a triage in the emergency unit with the medical swab and um, some gas cytometry and scanner to rats to make some gas cytometry in order to have uh, a diagnosis of uh, the respiratory distress of the patient. Uh, because one problem is that when you, you say COVID, in fact, it's not always COVID. Uh, we just make a triage on patients with respiratory distress over there. And uh, we had also a COVID medical unit uh, to hospitalize patients with mild symptoms. But COVID, as said before, is allowed. Disease and transmissible is something we already do not for us. Uh, from from uh, concerning myself, I face uh, such a challenge. Uh, so the requirement was to avoid hospital overwhelming uh, to ensure caregivers' protection. Uh, we have easy to apply protocols, to define patient circuits, training, and that is something very important because uh, it's very to work with the staff which has no formal training and it's very long to uh, train protective uh, care nurses. And uh, something that is interesting is supervision. Having someone looking at the people while they're working uh, to detect uh, failures or, or flaws. So, uh, we used our new hospital, new tech platform as a COVID hospital. 
And, uh, you have uh, the, the, the labs on the floor, uh, you have the emergency department, the ICU department on the third floor, and the uh, hospitalization beds uh, upstairs. This is our the organization. We have the 20 uh, beds uh, in our ICU, cardiac surgery ICU with 10 beds, uh, medical cardiac ICU with 12 beds, uh, our uh, cardiac rehabilitation unit, the post-operative ICU, and the stroke unit. So what we did, uh, we have a technical characteristic also with the air treatments, uh, allowing negative pressure uh, with an open circuit, so there's no side to not here and touchless door. What we did is that we uh, unit, small covered unit, but we had to stop uh, the elective surgery in order to uh, help the step, in fact. And we asked the stroke unit to move to the upper floor. So we had 10 beds there and 16 more beds on the left side of the, of the building. Uh, in fact, during March, we had to stand the COVID unit because we needed to dialyze uh, COVID patients. We had four patients needing hemodialysis. And we had a shortage on continuous dialysis. So we had to, uh, to use the uh, general critical units to dialyze the, the patients. Uh, so we had to push the critical care unit uh, in the recovery unit on the upper floor. And the next step would have been to move the cardiac critical care unit in, in the upper floor. So that was our project. It's not very easy to uh, to realize because uh, uh, human uh, problems, you know, uh, as uh, other specialists have their own constraints and it's very difficult for them to hear. Uh, they have to move to a new place. Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't know. Bluetooth mode. To we had uh, also to prepare biomedical device and uh, everything was okay for mechanical ventilation up to uh, 56 uh, rooms. Uh, otherwise, we had to, to take anesthesia, ventilator, or ventilation from the other hospital. Uh, the national help was, uh, was not possible because of the situation in France, in France at this moment. Uh, it was okay, quite open for the monitors, but it was shut in the compound uh, We had also staffing issues. We had to the uh, medical uh, rotations. Uh, we used 12 hours medical rotation to allow a medical doctors to go back home two days or three days a week. We had to train additional staff to take a look at technique as signature colors is something not very easy to do. We had to communicate a lot because uh, people were, were scared and uh, afraid of COVID. Uh, but once they with us, uh, the things became very easy and very uh, We used the French critical care ratio, which is two nurses for five patients, one well, uh, assistant for four patients. And we had to uh, work with the nurse, recovery room nurses, emergency department and nurses, which are nurses aware of what's a mechanical ventilator is, what's a monitor is, what's an electric syringe pump is. Uh, uh, concerning the equipment issues, uh, we have the same problem as the group with the uh, uh, um, That's, I think it's, it's not only a problem in Martinique. We had the shortage of drugs. 
And uh, what makes it uh, different from France is that we were very far, far, and we had only two planes a week, so it was uh, very difficult to adjust uh, our quests uh, to the available medication. We uh, took medication in other French territories and uh, also in the OECU countries, uh, which I would like to thank for that. Uh, we had ventilators and electrical syringe and monitors on order, but we don't know where they went to. Right? And we had problem also with lead supplies and reagents. Uh, concerning the clinical care, I won't be too long because uh, a lot of things have uh, already been said. What we use is standardized patient admission. Everything was written. Uh, you have this page, you can read, but it's not very important because it's in French. But uh, with this page, you, you can admit a patient and do what you, everything what you need to do to have them fit for critical care. And uh, after then, no one has uh, a lot to do with the patient. You have warnings about things not to do. Uh, for example, we had we have here not non-invasive mechanical ventilation and not no high flow oxygen therapy. Uh, things that uh, I believe are going to change in the future. Uh, we perform no integration outside the particular area. We had a lot of protocols for many things. Uh, this was organized in uh, about two weeks, and it was a very very was a huge amount of work. Uh, what I would like to to so to say also is that communication with the families was done by the medical doctors uh, twice or thrice a week. Uh, we used video streaming to communicate with the families. Uh, we allowed them to come to the hospital. But in fact, very few people came to the hospital because I believe it was scary. We had the TARTS imagery with very often pulmonary and And we had very strict criteria of admission. Uh, that was not, uh, I mean, the, the clinical picture was not very severe, but what we know is that the situation can change very quickly. So that was the, the criteria that had to, had to two of the these two criteria. The trap is, of course, respiratory distress is now totally COVID, and you have to stay in the medical doctor in order to uh, diagnose, for example, pulmonary edema or bipolar or uh, Concerning the mechanical ventilation, uh, we didn't have a lot of problems because we didn't have. Uh, severe IRDS. We, we had very few severe IRDS, and uh, the compliance was high, so it was not necessary to to uh, high deep. But uh, the main objective was to inhibit respiratory drive, as uh, said by Gattinoni, which is an Italian intensivist who talked about the, the, the problem. We had a few patients with uh, low compliance, and they were they were handled like severe allergies. I said, Michel, we had uh, two, and we managed uh, with uh, success. Uh, the the main point I think is to be patient because the mechanical ventilation was lasting two or three weeks at least. And uh, this point is very important is to manage the respiratory demand because you can induce ventilator, ventilator induced uh, lung injury, I mean, but the patient himself can in, in, uh, inflict himself self uh, inflicted uh, lung injuries. And that's why you have to control the respiratory drive using oxygen, for example. It's not only uh, sufficient, and sometimes you have to uh, 
exercise the patient on using that. As said before, uh, you have to use in order to avoid what we see there, which is a clot on the right atrium of one patient. And uh, this patient had severe pulmonary embolism. Antibiotics were quite systematic uh, at admission. We acted against that quite uh, pneumonia. Uh, we stirred as generation sponsoring plus microlide and later guided by pathological sampling, secondary infection was very low effect. Uh, there's no evidence for other trend treatments and uh, we used hydroxychloroquine in 20 patients. We had to withdraw it for nine patients because of all kind of because of kind of complications. Uh, until now we don't need anything more outside control. Two uh, medical doctors were infected at the beginning of the outbreak. They were tested negative. Uh, the issue we haven't identified was flaws in the protocols and lack of training. And we used a simulator to train uh, mainly on the management of the outbreak. What uh, the potential? For deterioration is the only thing I can say is that stress can be extremely durable, uh, and you have to keep an eye on uh, on the patients with symptoms of pneumonia. So we have followed people outside the hospital. I told you uh, one thousand. And forty-five patients. Uh, I think it was very efficient, and uh, the patients were satisfied. We need further analysis to uh, say if something very, really interesting in the management of such outcomes. So we don't need any other treatments because no one showed evidence of. Benefit. We are waiting for the results of uh, online studies, and we decided as soon as they win from mechanical ventilation that they stay in the, in the university hospital. Uh, what we changed is that we use we used high flow oxygen therapy than CPAP. Uh, I think twice. And uh, the patients uh, were not ventilated. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, fact because uh, if you are in shortage of a mechanical ventilator, that could be interesting. The main problem is to protect the caregivers from uh, virus spread across the, the room. Uh, also, we delayed trackers to me that we doing very, very frequently after a few days of mechanical ventilation, and we started to extubate the patient. We are included in uh, medical uh, research uh, in the Discovery study, which is the European study, French study, COVID IC, DISCO, which uh, analyzed the use of cortical therapy. Uh, in such patients. And uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to say our, our, our goal is first not to harm our patient, the patient, and don't give up too soon. This is the patient with the massive pulmonary embolism in the rehabilitation center. I think she will go back home in a couple of days. Uh, what we know is that prognosis in critical care is the delay before admission, so try not to be overwhelmed and try to be able to handle the patient as soon as he arrives. And the second point is you need a trained critical care team. I think we have to think about that for the future. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I will just give the floor to Dr. Um, uh, Reves for the questions. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the presentation, Dr. Dawi. Uh, we have a number of questions. We don't have too much time, but I have organized those questions. So uh, we have first a group of questions that are related with the ventilation of patients. And so uh, I'm going to read the three questions and I will, uh, and if uh, some of the presenters can uh, jump on, answer read those questions and their experience, it would be, so the first question is, did the previous presenter, so patients that were ventilated did better than those that were not ventilated? If so, what was the mode treatment that uh, for those who weren't ventilated? And then there was a second question that is uh, similar to that to this one. So as in for severe patients who are ventilated, well, if there are some other options and what were the outcomes? And then there was a question also related with the ventilation uh, that I would like to know the experience on managing cases being ventilated for more than one month. And the last question related with ventilation is if they have considered tracheostomy if they think that that help, and uh, then uh, uh, so those are the four questions that we have on ventilation. So uh, I, I would like to very briefly uh, give the floor to each one of the presenters, uh, if they can give uh, give us their experience on this, uh, please. Uh, if you can be very brief in your answers to the four questions, I will we would appreciate it. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Uh, Michel Carles. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I I didn't get the, the first question, but uh, uh, about uh, time of ventilation for a very long um, ventilation of some patients, as we did because uh, it's a very common uh, way for the, those patients. Uh, just to say that uh, as told uh, Dr. Meda, we we have to be patient to be the less invasive poss possibly uh, with um, uh, a very frequent prone uh, ventilation. And uh, um, I, I won't say more, uh, just be patient and uh, less in invasive and be very, very patient. Uh, what's why, what were the other questions? The other, the other one was related to tracheostomy. Yes, but uh, we, in our point of, point of view, the tracheostomy was not very early in patients, but for um, for patients uh, more than four weeks of ventilation, we we went to the to the tracheostomy with with some good results. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ford, uh Please. <clears throat> Any additional comment? I am going to uh, defer this question to Dr. Lovell or Dr. Hassel, uh, the ICU consultants who are corporate answers. Uh, hello, good, good afternoon. This is Dr. Lovell. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. I, uh, yeah, we had a similar approach in that um, we tried to uh, non-invasive methods um, as much as possible before resorting to invasive ventilation. So things like um, using CPAP, non-invasive positive pressure, as well as proning patients early, um, using incentive spirometers, all these things we kind of put in practice in an attempt not to have to um, use invasive, invasive ventilation if, if, if it was absolutely necessary. Um, in the case of patients who were ventilated for a very long time, we, we did have challenges with one patient in particular. Um, and we too, like the previous speaker said, were making plans to, to go to a tracheostomy once logistically feasible uh, around the one month mark. But unfortunately her condition deteriorated soon after and we never were able to get to, to, to that point. But that was our take when it came to, to managing someone who who was on the ventilator uh, for an extended period. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Um, Amory Hassel wants to make any additions. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Good Go afternoon. Ahead. This is 
is that Ray Hassel, also from Barbados. Uh, I agree with everything that Dr. Lovell just um, said. Uh, we, we, we only had three patients that were actually invasively delayed, and all three were proned, uh, and um, we used higher tools and lower peeps on those patients. Um, but uh, the, the two of them demise, one got better, and then she got worse again, but I think that was a ventilator-associated infection instead. Thank you, Dr. Metawith. If you have uh, any additional comment, okay. Our next question is related. Uh, there is a question that is related with equipment, which is our host. Uh, remote hospital does not have x-ray imaging available. Is it true that ultrasonic imaging may be an alternative method for recognizing AVRS early? Uh, so if any one of the speakers have a, a response to that, Mark, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this question. What is the role of imaging for diagnosis and managing of care? Yeah, this is a challenge. And even, uh, you know, x-ray early on may not be that useful. It's certainly not as sensitive to get a chest x-ray compared to a CT scan for subtle changes. Um, once I think, once someone has changes, then it may be useful for monitoring how things are progressing uh, or, or improving. But uh, there are some centers that have used ultrasound as a way to assess patients as well. And they, they can look for, for I think, the, curly lines or things like that, but I'm not an ultrasound person myself. I, I'd, I'd be interested to hear if others here have used that. Uh, it is one way, you know, because it's a smaller machine, you can do a bedside, it's a lot easier than a big, big old x-ray, even the portable x-ray machines are huge. And so uh, it may be an easier way that can be maneuvered in and out of uh, rooms with the appropriate de decontamination of the machine. I'm curious if others uh, have used that in the ICU themselves. Over. Any other commentary regarding this question to the speakers? Yes, maybe just to say that um, there is uh, no specific uh, imaging for COVID, uh, even if there is a lot of literature about uh, CT scan, but uh, we, we are now facing uh, people having um, some CT scan uh, images uh, um, falsely interpreted as uh, COVID, uh, and uh, so I think that the imaging is is not the, the the cornerstone of the diagnosis for patients, especially if you don't have X-ray. The, the the ultrasound can be can help to to see the the, the pulmonary uh, tissue, but not with a specific uh, uh, stuff. So very much. We have now three questions that are specifically from Barbados, Dr. De Forge, and I will appreciate if you are brief in the response because we only have uh, four or five minutes left. Uh, the first one is, did you use anticoagulation in all patients in Barbados? The second one, if you can expand on the role of governmental staffing for COVID response. And the third one, uh, if you can elaborate the COVID-related medication used for treatment. And if any one of the other speakers have any uh, additional commentary on this, you are also welcome to, to respond. Please, Dr. Ford. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, perfect. Right, so I can answer, I'll start off by answering uh, all the patients um, were on DVD prophylaxis. Um, or prophylactic um, dosage, dosages, um, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, at the government level, um, it, from the level of the, the emergency operations center, um, we were able to mobilize um, staff from the outside, so there are doctors on the island, uh, we were able to, to mobilize from the inside, whether they were from uh, the private care sector, to, to mobilize them, train them into the system and uh, allow them to function to assist us. Um, so, so that that level of activity came from very high levels in government. In pulling very early in the outbreak, we pulled 
to gather the, 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 the doctors in the public, public, public health system and those in the private health system to assist. Um, and I can't remember what the third question was. Uh, the, the third one was related to medication use for treatment. So medications, we didn't really experiment um, um, uh, much in our patients. We had three ventilated patients, um, but our, our antibiotic um, therapy would have included um, initially, I um, mean, you know, augmenting a ceftrop, some of the uh, the subsequent addition of vancomycin, um, and patients actually did um, pretty well. Um, even the one of them who died, um, we thought she, just, she died of a ventilator associated pneumonia uh, and not directly related. Uh, probably directly related, indirectly, sorry, related to COVID. Thank you very much. We have two last questions, and then we will have to close the, uh, the webinar. So uh, the, the first one is, were medical teams who were dedicated for COVID being isolated? Did they work in shifts? That's the first question. And the other one is related to uh, limited, limited access to face shields. And they say, do any of the presenters have advice for developing uh, their own face shields so, uh, for healthcare and dental providers? And if they can give their experience of that. Maybe even Joao can help to answer that one. So please, if one of the presenters wants to answer these questions related to it, uh, with the teams. Answer the question of facials briefly. So Barbados, uh, we did have we do have a adequate amount, but to extend that amount, we've been working with the parties on the on the in the country. We have three printers to 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 assist us with that. Thank you. Anyone of the presenter have any other commentary to those questions? Or to any of the previous questions, Doctor Edawi, if you have any other additional comment. I think Rufus that we are just on time a little bit late. So please, if you want to, to close the, the webinar. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ulrich, and, um, and to you as well, Zhao. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for their excellent presentations, um, which obviously highlighted the, your resourcefulness um, in, in giving us the insight uh, into your challenges that you experience um, and I saw most of them, uh, many of them insurmountable tasks, but you effectively managed to respond to this COVID-19 pandemic. We, we continue to learn more each day about COVID-19, not only uh, its effect on the human population, but also about what we can do to stop it. And so this kind of fur um, such as these will, uh, will help us ensure experiences that will facilitate learning, the learning process and the development of best practices and guidelines. So uh, we look forward to additional webinars like this on COVID-19 clinical management experiences um, from our Caribbean countries. And we hope that we can organize in the future, um, including some of the other larger uh, countries within the Caribbean sub-region um, to share their experiences uh, in this kind of forum. So uh, thank you to all of the participants and the presenters uh, and have a good evening and a great weekend. Be safe.